most churches we'd be saying have a wonderful day and inviting you to a fellowship meal about right now. Amen. But instead we're going to invite you to turn to number 290 in your hymnal. We're going to sing the chorus, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, and we invite everyone to stand. Jacob was the dad. 
the brothers were the 12 tribes of Israel. So Joseph is working as a slave for Potiphar in the house of Potiphar. There's a wife. And Joseph is so diligent in his relationship with Jesus, with the Lord, with the God of his father, Jacob, that he is able to make Potiphar prosper. But there is another person in, in Potiphar's life, and that's Potiphar's wife. And Potiphar wants to take Joseph for her own little boy toy. When it happens that he runs away, she tells her husband. Her husband says, even though he harmless, believes De, uh, Joseph to be harmless, he has to believe his wife, and he has to put Joseph in jail. Joseph goes to jail, to prison. He's in prison, and while he's in prison, two people came to prison with him, the cupbearer of Pharaoh, and also the, cup, the, the Pharaoh's baker. They have dreams, so that they get to go to, to, to this prison, where guess what? Again, Joseph has been so diligent in his relationship with, jo with God that he's in charge of the prison. The guy that has the prison doesn't have to do much except for let Joseph be in charge. So the cupbearer has a dream. Joseph is told the dream. Joseph interprets the dream and tells the cupbearer he's going to get to go back to Pharaoh's house. So Pharaoh is now having his own dream. The cupbearer, who had forgotten Joseph for many years, remembers that Joseph is able to interpret dreams, and so they go and they get Joseph out of the prison. They take him to the pharaohs, the pharaohs, the king, take him to the pharaoh, and at that point, Joseph interprets the dream that there's going to be uh, seven years of good food, lots of grain is going to grow, and then there's going to be seven years of famine. Joseph comes up with the idea, let's store up the stuff during the good years and then we'll sell it and to the people when they're having the famine. He's now second in charge next to the Pharaoh. What a, what a turn of uh, circumstances from being sold as a slave, put in prison for a false accusation, and now he's second in command to the Pharaoh. I have one over here somewhere. Raised on the rescue, I got I've got dry my mouth and it's uh, showing problem. So he's out there supervising them as they lay up all these um, these crops. So in case of when the famine comes, well, the uh, he's in charge, second to Pharaoh. And then the famine does come, and people come and they buy the the crops from Joseph. Joseph, in the meantime, is still in charge, but these people are getting very, very hungry, and the word that there's food down in Egypt comes to Jacob and the 11 remaining brothers. So, they send them down to Egypt, only they don't let the youngest, Benjamin, go. Now, here's part of the intrigue of the story. Benjamin and Joseph had the same mother, Rachel. Rachel was the woman that jo Jacob wanted to marry, but he was tricked by his father-in-law, Laban, and he ended up with, what was her name? Leah. Leah. And so Leah has uh, ten sons. Rachel has two sons, and these two sons are his favorite. Joseph, as you see, has already been hated for being the favorite, and he's already received his uh, rather interesting uh, payback from the brothers. So Benjamin stays back. And they head down to Egypt, and they get to Egypt, and look how surprised Joseph is. I thought this was a good laugh. Joseph can't believe it. Here's his brothers coming from um, where he grew up, and they're asking for food. So they don't know that that's Joseph. So Joseph's brothers bow down, and they're asking for this food to be given to them. Now Joseph gets a little payback. He's going to find out if they've had any character change. So he arrests them and puts them all in jail for three days. When they get out, they are, uh, of course, they're shocked. And they're, uh, they're, they're amazed that, that the Pharaoh thinks they're spies. And he proposes all kinds of ideas that, to try to prove that they uh, have changed their mind. Joseph really wants to find out their character has changed. And yet his heart is touched because he still loves his brother and he doesn't see Benjamin. So he concocts his plan um, that more, you can't come back for any more food unless you bring your younger brother back. 
And one of them has to stay in jail. Well, this is uh, Simeon, the one that really plotted the real story to get him thrown in that, uh, into that pit and sold. Simeon has to stay in jail until the, they get to come back with Benjamin. Well, the father, is, Jacob, is so upset. He does not want to see his only remaining child of Rachel, Benjamin, be taken away. He's already lost Joseph, but now he's also excited because they, they don't know yet, you see, that that's Joseph they were talking to. So they get hungrier, more hungry, and more hungry. And uh, he's begging that he will, um, I think that was Judah. Judah said, you know, if anything happens, you can take my sons. Well, big payback. How do you lose one child and take somebody else's kids and be happy? Not exactly a good exchange plan, but uh, finally they're so hungry that Jacob changes his mind and they all start off with some gifts from Jacob to go down to Egypt to help Pharaoh have a good experience and sell them some food. And there's Benjamin, so he gets invited to meet Benjamin. I know it's a long story, but not everybody knows this story. So here we have Joseph with his uh, chief pharaoh assistant kind of person, and there they present Benjamin. Well, after that, guess who gets to get out of prison? Simon, Simeon. And uh, Joseph is, they don't know that it's Joseph, but Joseph knows that it's Benjamin. And he recognizes it, and in fact, he even sees the resemblance of his own mother and his brother. Do you see that sometimes? Yes, and it's very tender, isn't it? It touches your heart. So Joseph is weeping. He goes into another room and cries his eyes out. Everybody can hear him. Then he makes a feast for these spies that he's just let out of prison and who have just come back with Benjamin. And he sits them down in order of their birth birthdays. And they're kind of surprised that somehow somebody knows what order of their birthdays is. But finally, Joseph can't take it anymore. And Joseph, in the land of no forgiveness, decides to forgive. And he lets his brother, he embraces his brother Benjamin, and he embraces his brothers, uh, all the rest, the other, all the rest of them, ten of them. I don't know how to memorize their names, so I don't know their names. Well. But all the rest of the brothers get a hug too. Was that a fast story? I love those pictures I found on the internet. Weren't they cool? But in all of his trials, did Joseph ever hold a grudge against God? I guess that's a big question. No. When, uh, did he work out his anger against his brothers? Did he become a miserable person? Did he develop a, a, a sickness related to his resentment? No, no not that we know. Did he carry a burden of hatred with him as he labored? No. No, he seems to have had success everywhere he went. Or was he a conqueror with God and a true Israelite like his father, Jacob? Amen. Amen, he was. Our, our uh, verse that we had this morning was from Luke chapter 6, verse 37. Jesus is preaching on the, Mount, uh, on the uh, Sermon on the Mount. And he gets those words, and most people understand these, they always know these. They always are able to say, do not judge others, or you will not be judged. And they say, no, don't judge me. You know, they just mostly say, don't judge me, is what most people are saying. That's what I mostly say. And then, do not condemn others, or it will come back on you. But the real question is, the real amazing verse here is, forgive others, and you will be forgiven. Now, who has the power to forgive? So we're talking about God making a conditional, what do we call that, quote, a quid, quid pro quo? Quid one thing for another. It's a quid pro quo. Yes. Come on, guys, say it for me. Quid pro quo. What they say. With God. With God. And so, forgive others and you will be forgiven. Patty's saying the beautiful Lord's Prayer. I asked her, Patty, can you sing the Lord's Prayer for us? And she said, we can maybe make it with music and violin. I said, oh, we need the lyric. We need the words. And didn't it touch our hearts? Doesn't it touch our hearts when we can say, Our Father which art in heaven? Would you read this with me if you can see it on the screen or if you know it by heart? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. The end, right? No, no, not the end. As we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You know, when Joseph's brothers were up there where they lived, they could not ask Joseph for forgiveness. They couldn't tell him how sorry they were. But you know, their characters did change, and they began to care for one another and take care of one another. A lot of those verses that you were reading to us, Linda, had to do with the church taking care of one another and loving one another. But they did not have the privilege of going to Joseph and saying, Joseph, we're sorry. They never could go to their father and say, Father, we broke your heart with a lie. We broke your heart with a lie. We told you Joseph was dead. And imagine how they felt when they finally had to go tell him, Guess what, Dad? Joseph is alive. They didn't have the privilege. They didn't really have the privilege of setting that straight. They were in a land of no forgiveness. But we don't live in a land of no forgiveness. So here's a question. How can you or how can I be compassionate to someone who's hurting you? And or who has hurt you? Because we all know lots of people who are alcoholics or drug, uh, drug addicts or they're mentally ill. And with that comes a lot of behavior that can be very, very harmful. Harmful to us in our relationship with that person. But we can have forgiveness versus forgetness. It's hard to forget what some people have done to some people, isn't it? So the question is, how can we be compassionate to someone who is hurting us or who has hurt us? And we can look at some of those categories of troubles that people have. If we're going to do compassion, we're going to have to recognize uh, humanity in everyone. Do you recognize humanity in everyone? Or have you managed to turn them into objects or animals or something that you can hate? That's what they did in the Nazi Germany. They compared the enemies of, uh, of the state to rats, rodents, vermin. And that way you could hate rats, you could hate rodents, you could hate vermin because you didn't have to think of them as people anymore. So when that happens to us, we have to remember that we can recognize the humanity that Jesus died for in everyone. Are we able to act compassionately to everyone? Or are we tired? Or are we hungry? Or are we angry? Which makes us hangry and we need a Snickers bar or something. we got to act compassionately to everyone. Well, this uh, lady, I'm not sure, I, I, I'm sure I don't agree with everything she said, but I was listening to something that she did say. Her name is Brene Brown, and she has concepts of people who actually have compassion. And one of the things they found out about people who are compassionate that were measured and found and uh, analyzed by other people, oh, there's a compassionate person. And then they interviewed those compassionate persons, and they did a, you know, a scientific study about finding out what were the things that were in common with all these compassionate people. And one of them was that they, that, that compassionate person knew what was okay and what was not okay. Sounds like understanding God's law, you know, what's right and what's wrong. They knew what was okay and they knew what was not okay. And the other thing that they had is they said, I do not subject myself to the abuse of others. Hmm. So then they said, but I thought you are compassionate. And their answer was, I'm compassionate because I don't subject myself to the abuse of other people. Or I can be compassionate because I don't subject myself to the abuse of other people. So that to me sounds a lot like a boundary. And we're going to talk about that in a second. Mark chapter 6 verse 34 was Jesus compassionate is the question. And, and this one says, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. And when you think about it,
about that. You can go find Jesus was compassionate on them. He fed them. He healed them. He taught them. Yeah. He had compassion. Passion means feeling, and compassion means having feelings with the person that you're um, dealing with. So this lady, Brene Brown, came up with B for what boundaries need to be in place for me, I for me to be in my integrity, being who I know that I am, and still be generous towards you. So they called it this concept of big. And then they had the rest of their study and their research. They asked people this question. Do you believe that people are doing the best they can? Think about that for a second. Do you believe that people are doing the best they can? Do you believe in general that when people wake up every day, they're doing the best they can? I already saw some people shake their head no. Well, this usually splits about 50-50. And half of those service, surveys said they, they believe that people are not doing the best they can. And since that was the, the case, it's very hard to be compassionate to someone who is hurting you, especially if you believe that people are not doing the best they can. Right? You agree? Yes. yes. Yeah. So now we're going to do a little bit of a, an exercise. And I hope that you get the blessing I got out of this because it, it really was a good blessing for me. I want you to picture someone in your life who you believe is not doing the best they can. Somebody picture this person who really irritates you and just makes you crazy. You thinking? You getting a picture? Uh, it really does help if you think of a, if somebody who's getting on your nerves for whatever reason. And these people that have compassion were asked this question. You got the person? They wrote it down on a napkin and then they compared it with each other. Some of them were clergy that worked in the Episcopal Church and one couple actually wrote down the same person's name. And it was actually a lady who lived out in a desert with her husband and in a trailer. And they would bring them food and they would bring them uh, money. And they would take the money uh, to buy formula. They'd uh, loot the money, the formula with water and take the money so they could go gambling. Mostly it was the father. And this poor family had had children removed by Child Protective Services many times. And every time they did have that happen, then they would go ahead and have another child. And the child would be uh, taken by Child Protective Services because it was a failure to thrive because the formula was diluted with water. And this uh, Episcopal couple that were deacons that traveled to different places, they said, they both wrote down the name of this person, mostly it was the father, and they wrote that down. Now, imagine this. What if God came down and said to you, the person that's in your mind, just now. He or she is doing the very best they can right now. I didn't know it was going to make me feel this way up here in front. But they, she said that the reaction was physical every time. People would bend their heads over and they'd start crying. They'd start sobbing as they thought about what the person that was really bothering them was going through. So the question is, how does that affect the way that we're going to treat them? And how are we going to cope with people who have hurt us? And part of that is if you accept that people are doing the best they can in life, how does that affect the way that you treat them? And how do you cope with people who hurt you? Well, Joseph gives us a good example. That's why we ran through his story. And I would have to stop being angry if God told me that this person was doing the best they can. I'd have to start grieving for that person 
I would try to love that person, but I'd have boundaries about what I allowed in my space because that would be my integrity. And uh, we don't want to change what we think is right and wrong if we're on God's word. So this was interesting. Uh, this lady, Brene Brown, asked her husband Steve this same question. I love that she gave him time because she, she asked him, do you think people are doing the best they can? And he thought about it and he came back with this answer. It took him 15 minutes before he came back and talked to her and he said, I have no idea, but what I do know is my life is better when I assume that they do. Amen. That they are doing the best that they can. Do we call that giving people the benefit of the doubt? Mm -hmm. We do, don't we? Giving them, giving them some kind of uh, credence because they're created by God. And it's not my job. I can't put them in heaven. I can't put them in hell. I can't take them to the post and flog them. It wouldn't help much anyway. <laughs> so the question that we're going to ask ourselves is, is my life better? when I assume that people are doing the best they can today and in this moment. Wow. Let's take that home. Let's take that home. And let's wrap it around that person that we thought about. Because we're back to our, uh, our scripture, and our scripture said, Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others, and it will not, or it will all come back on you. Forgive others, and you will be forgiven. There's a little conditional thing there that we have to somehow forgive. And this, I wish I had more time for this, but um, there's a book called The Great Divorce written by C.S. Lewis. This is a, you can get a PDF of it right on the, on the internet. And this is, this person is on a bus. It's a story, of, it's an imaginary allegory about heaven and hell. This seems to be the part of going to hell. And uh, he tells his story on the bus, okay? It's, they, they find this town, and he says, it the, seems the deuce of a town I volunteered, and that's what I can't understand. Uh, the parts of it that I saw were so empty. Was there once a much larger population? Not at all, said my neighbor. The trouble is that they're so quarrelsome. As soon as anyone arrives, he settles in some street. Be before he's been there 24 hours, he quarrels with his neighbor. And before the week is over, he's quarreled so badly that he decides to move. And very likely, he finds the next street empty because all the people there have quarreled with their neighbors and moved. So he settles in. If by any chance the street is full, he goes further. But even if he stays, it makes no odds. He's sure to have another quarrel pretty soon, and then he'll move on again. Finally, he'll move right out to the edge of town and build a new house. You see, it's easy here. You've only got to think a house, and there it is. And that's how the town keeps on growing, leaving more and more empty streets. That's right. I don't know about you, but my easiest go-to reaction when uh, somebody hurts me, cut them off. I don't need them, and they don't need me, and I will never talk to that person again. I don't have to call them. I don't have to visit them. I don't have to think about it. Cut them off. Move town to another street. Have my own house. And everybody's quarreling and everybody's moving in this analogy. So that's something that this story, The Great Divorce, is about. So if we're going to picture in our life who you believe is not doing the best they can, what really irritates you, and we've got this, it looks like I did this twice, this exercise. What if God came down and said to you, this person that you just pictured in your mind just now, he or she is doing the very best they can right now. Well, I've got a beautiful thing about dying to self, but we don't have time to share. Look at this. We do have No. When you are forgotten or neglected or purposely set at naught, and you do not sting and hurt at the oversight, but your heart is happy being counted worthy to suffer for Christ, that is dying to self. And when your good is evil spoken of, or when your wishes are crossed, your advice disregarded, your opinions ridiculed, and you refuse to let anger rise in your heart, or even defend yourself, but take it all in patient, loving silence, that is dying to self. 
and when you lovingly and patiently bear any disorder, everybody knows around here that I like order. I like things to be on time. No. <laughs> when you lovingly and, bear, and patiently bear any disorder, any irregularity, any impunctuality, or any annoyance, when you can stand face to face with waste, folly, extravagance, spiritual insensibility, and endure it as Jesus endured it, that is dying to self. And when you are content with any food, any offering, any raiment, any climate, any society, any solitude, any interruption by the will of God, that is dying to self. And when you never care to refer to yourself in conversation or to record your own good works,